Hmm. We are so grateful uh, for all the work that Justin has done over the years in promoting these conversations and inviting us uh, to conversation with him and excited for what it means to have him here tonight. Justin Lee. Oh, my word. I am so nervous, y'all. <laughs> like, I got the invitation to come speak at Baylor, and I was like, oh, that's awesome, Baylor. I've never spoken at Baylor. That's really, really great. And then, like, people were like, you know, it's a big deal, right? <laughs> I'm like, yeah, yeah, no, I mean, it's, you know, I'm, I'm speaking on a fair number of conservative Christian campuses where, you know, it's a, it's a big deal uh, that I'm speaking to people like, no, it's a, it's a really big deal. <laughs> and then I, and I get here and everybody's like, oh, I'm so glad you're here. I'm so glad you're here. <laughs> And everybody's like, it's a really big deal, and like lots of people are going to be watching what I have to say, and there's lots of, you know, s tension and stuff that's been on campus, and there are going to be people there in the audience or who watch the video who are like on, in really different places, and they're going to be picking apart everything you say, so be really careful about what you say. Also, you're representing me and everyone I know and everything that we believe in. <laughs> You're the first! <laughs> and, and it's a Christian campus, so make sure you stay within Christian tradition as Baylor understands it. I'm like, y'all, you are making me really nervous. This is like... This is, this is, you know, I was okay until you started talking about this being a big deal. And people were like, Justin, Justin, don't think that we don't care, but every hope and every prayer rests on you now. <laughs> and that's Phantom of the Opera. Um, I have to make one obligatory musical reference. It's in my contract. Um, so. I live my life here. <laughs> I was in Nashville and I saw this intersection and I was like, I need to take a picture of that. <laughs> That's my life. And it's a yellow light. <laughs> Um, so, yeah, I want to talk about Christianity and LGBTQ persons, and that persons part is really important because I think we spend a lot of time talking about LGBTQ issues, and we're going to talk about issues tonight, but I want to talk about issues through the lens of talking about actual people, because God loves people more than God loves issues, I'm convinced. And I think that even with all of the theological disagreements that we may have on all kinds of issues, if we're called to do anything as Christians, it's to love one another. Thank you very much. That's the end of the <laughs> I did it. I did it. So I wrote a book called Torn, Rescuing the Gospel from the Gays versus Christians Debate that's got a bunch of my story in it. I'm a Christian, let me start with that. I'm a Christian, first and foremost. My faith has been at the core of who I am from the very beginning of my life. Um, I was raised in a loving, devout, two-parent Christian home. Somebody said, oh, you could have ended up at Baylor. And I, you know, really, I could have. I didn't actually know any gay people that I knew of. <laughs> Don't get ahead of me. <laughs> It wasn't until I was 18 that I finally had this realization, oh, 
all this time when I've heard people talk about gay people, and the image in my mind has been like guys in thongs in pride parades, which is like the opposite of me. <laughs> They're not just talking about guys in thongs and pride parades or people who have some kind of voracious sexual appetite and they're like everything is about sex for them or rebels against God or all the things that came to mind when I thought of gay men. They're not just talking about that. When they say gay, they mean somebody who's attracted to the same sex, like me. And I started to talk to my Christian friends and say, I think that I'm gay and I don't think that it's changing and I don't know what to do. Because I've always believed that it's a sin, like that marriage is between a man and a woman, but I don't want to marry someone I'm not attracted to. That doesn't seem fair to her. I don't want to be alone for the rest of my life. I don't know if I can reconcile scripture with same-sex marriage. I don't even know where my place is in the church. I have been, for the last 20 years, having this conversation with a lot of folks, a lot of LGBTQ folks, not just gay Christians, but LGBTQ Christians, and a lot of straight cisgender Christians. Cisgender is to transgender as straight is to gay, you know. But a lot of, of non-LGBTQ Christians who are like, this is, a, this is a tough conversation, and we're trying to figure out how to have this conversation. We want to be loving, but we have these questions. And I didn't want to come tonight and just tell you my, all of my personal uh, biblical, theological analysis and stuff. I could do that. I've done talks like that. But that's not really where my heart is. And I don't think, I kind of feel like all of you by now probably know what you believe the Bible says about all of this. And probably even if I told you what I thought, you would all go out believing exactly what you came in believing. So that's not what I want to talk about tonight. What I want to talk about is where do we go from here as a church, as a body of Christ, on a campus like Baylor, but also as individuals. One of the things I didn't realize growing up is that this is actually a fairly new conversation in the church. We think about this as something that, oh, the church has been talking about this for 2,000 years. The church hasn't been talking about this for 2,000 years. Now, there are times throughout church history that, that you know, church fathers or, or in scripture, we see people writing about same-sex sex in particular contexts. But we haven't been having a conversation in the church for 2,000 years about, oh, some people are gay, some people are bi, some people are trans. What do we do for these folks as a church? What is God calling those people to? What does God's calling look like for them? What does God's calling look like for us as the church as we relate to LGBTQ folks? This is not a conversation we've been having for 2,000 years. In fact, this is a conversation that has happened almost entirely within the lifetimes of people who are around today. If it feels like we're still a little like, eh, trying to figure this out, that's a technical term, eh? <laughs> that's part of why because this is still a fairly new conversation. I mean, you think about it, somebody who's in their 70s now, like our current president and several of the top contenders for that spot are all in their 70s. Um, some of the most influential evangelicals of, uh, of my lifetime, folks like James Dobson and Pat Robertson are in their 80s. But somebody in their 70s right now, they grew up in the 1950s. They were born in the 40s, grew up in the 50s. Think about what this country was like in the 50s. Think about the racial dynamics in this country in the 50s. Think about the gender roles in the 50s. But one of the most popular sitcoms in the 50s was I Love Lucy. One of the most popular episodes of I Love Lucy is an episode where the, the female characters go out into the workforce to find jobs and the male characters stay home and try to keep house and everything's a disaster because nobody can do those jobs. And so in the end, they agree to take on their, their assigned gender roles once more and everybody's happy. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's still a funny episode, but <laughs> imagine in the context of that culture prior to the civil rights legislation of the 60s, and all, imagine in that context coming out and being like, hey, everybody, I'm attracted to the same sex. My gender identity is not the same thing that you see on the outside. That would not have been an easy conversation. Um, that's not something very many people did. Sort of the beginning of what people think of as the beginning of the, the, the gay liberation movement with uh, people starting to be encouraged to come out was 1969, the Stonewall riots. Uh, through the 70s, you had some you know, more people coming out. But even into the, to the 80s and the 90s, still a lot of folks who were in prominent positions 
did not come out for fear of losing their jobs, losing the respect of people. Ellen DeGeneres came out in 1997. That was the year after I came out, so I beat her, so I win. <laughs> When Ellen's sitcom character came out in 1997, many uh, network affiliates ran a warning at the beginning of the episode because her saying, I'm gay, in the episode was so controversial. The like president of my network affiliate was like on the TV being like, you may not want your family to see this episode because she said, I'm gay. It was still a really big deal, a really controversial thing. And you know, those of you who were not around or aware of the conversation happening at this time need to know that like, this is still fairly new, that we're having this conversation as openly as we are now. In 1965, an evangelical man by the name of Ralph Blair gave a talk, he was a, an employee of InterVarsity Christian Fellowship, gave a talk at Yale in which he advocated for Christians supporting same-sex relationships. Uh, that did not go over well at that time. But he was, a, he was four years ahead of Stonewall. Mm -hmm. Troy Perry in uh, California was 28 years old in 1968 when he created the first church that was focused on ministry to the LGBTQ community in Los Angeles. Um, there were folks in those early days starting to have this conversation about what it, how does the church respond, even some on the uh, most affirming side, as those two men were, but also they were both gay and both you know, had a personal experience that was driving some of that. But for the most part, they would have been considered very fringe by the church. In the 1970s, um, as people were starting to have this conversation, some brave Christians came out and said, hey, this is something I'm struggling with, what do I do? And they got together and they started to form these support groups in the hopes of becoming straight. And they formed what became the first ex-gay ministries. And in 1976, those ex-gay groups formed, uh, came together to form a group called Exodus, which for many years was the standard bearer in ex-gay uh, ministry, gay people trying to become straight. In the 80s, um, this had been going on for a decade, uh, but they weren't seeing people become straight, but they did already call themselves ex-gays as a kind of name it and claim it thing, like we're gonna claim this label, even though we're not there yet, but like we don't wanna identify as gay, even though we're still same-sex attracted. Um, but in the midst of that, a woman named Elizabeth Moberly wrote a book that was kind of directed at the church called Homosexuality, A New Christian Ethic, in which she argued, uh, hey, maybe gay people aren't evil, church. Maybe they're just sick. And that sounds horrible right now, but you have to understand in 1983, this was for many Christians a significant step forward. Oh, people didn't choose to be gay. Moberly believed that being gay was a result of unmet emotional needs from your childhood relating to your parents, and that if you could get those emotional needs met as an adult, your same-sex attractions would go away and you would develop opposite-sex attractions. That was great news for the folks at Exodus who had been trying through purely theological means to become straight and it hadn't worked. And so some Exodus groups began to adopt Elizabeth Moberly's what became known as the reparative, uh, reparative drive dynamic and later became reparative therapy. But even into the 90s, nobody was becoming straight. Some ex-gay groups tried exorcisms, thinking maybe it was demons. Some ex-gay groups tried more psychological therapy approaches. Some ex-gay groups tried really radical stuff. Some tried really like normal stuff. Some tried just lots of like prayer and Bible study and working on their spiritual lives in the hopes that if they just waited on God's timing that it would happen. Some went ahead and married members of the opposite sex as steps of faith. And many of those marriages ultimately crumbled, sadly. So when I came out, I didn't know all of this stuff, but I was starting to see that the ex-gay thing wasn't working. And as I met a bunch of these uh, ex-gay folks, I became more and more convinced that it didn't work. But a lot of my friends were not so convinced. And when I started to say to my friends, I don't think that this ex-gay thing is gonna work, I think I might be gay for the rest of my life and I don't know what to do about it, all, a bunch of them said the same thing to me. Because there was one guy who did seem to have a real gay to straight success story. 
and everybody knew his name if they paid attention to this stuff at all in the 90s. His name was John Polk, and he wrote a book called Not Afraid to Change. And I don't know if you can see on this slide, so let me zoom in for you. The subtitle is The Remarkable Story of How One Man Overcame Homosexuality. And John, unlike a lot of the ex-gays, was not shy about claiming you can become straight. On the back of the book it says, can a homosexual become straight? Oh, some people say no. They say gays can't change. But it's not true. An increasing number of men and women around the world are living proof that those authorities are wrong. John Polk is a former homosexual. And then like a lot of these stories, it's like sex was life and partner after partner happily took their turn, you know, like all the gay men do. Um, so people said to me, how can you say gay people can't become straight if John Polk became straight? And I would say, well, I don't know, maybe he did, but it doesn't seem to be working for me or anybody I know. You know, I don't know what to tell you. John Polk was everywhere. John and his aunt wife were on the cover of Newsweek. There they are. Um, John was the John was the homosexuality and gender specialist for Focus on the Family. He was the chairman of the board of Exodus International. He was the guy responsible for all the stuff James Dobson sent out about gay people and the fact that gay people could become straight. And then John Paul got photographed in a gay bar and claimed he didn't know it was a gay bar when he went in. <laughs> I'm not, and I'm not even saying that to make a joke. Like, that's really what happened. And they kept him on at Focus on the Family. He continued to write stuff telling people that gays could become straight, and James Dobson continued to cite John Polk as proof that gay people can become straight, even having known that John Polk had been caught in a gay bar on a business trip and lied about it. Today, John Polk admits that he was never straight, that he was always gay, and that he felt pressured to say that he was straight because it's what he believed the church wanted. Alan Chambers, who was the head of Exodus International, who was the president of Exodus for 10 years, a few years ago, admitted that, in his words, 99.9% .9 of the people who went through Exodus did not become straight. I had him on my live uh, Facebook Live show a few weeks ago, and he said, actually, I want to revise that to 100% because I was thinking of one exception when I said that, and that exception turned out not to be an exception. Another group sprung up in the wake of Exodus. Exodus closed, having admitted that they were not making people straight, that God wasn't making, making people straight through them, that the straight thing wasn't happening. Another group sprung up called Hope for Wholeness. And they said, look, we're sorry Exodus closed down, but we're going to keep doing this work. Um, McCray Game, who was the head of Hope for Wholeness just last month, admitted that that didn't work either, and that he also is gay, having claimed for many years that he was straight. This is important to understand because this has been the history of the ex-gay movement. It keeps happening over and 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 over. Now what? Some of you are wondering why I just spent so much time on the ex-gay movement when it seems like it's in the past. Partly because it's not in the past. There are still a lot of ex-gay groups that are around today. A lot of them have changed their language so that they don't sound ex-gay. But for some people, this is still news. Because a lot of people I meet, a lot of well-meaning, loving, compassionate Christians I meet still think that if I would go to the right ministry, that I would become straight. And they will point to somebody and they'll say, I know this person's testimony. They wrote a book, or I've heard them speak, and I know that they have become straight. And I. What I don't say to them is, I know that person, and I know they're not straight, but it's not my place to tell you that. At the very least, we can say that many people who have tried to become straight did not. Ditto for folks who tried not to be trans. Um, so we're left with this question as a church. What do we do? Now what? Even if some people could become straight, and become cisgender, if there are any of us, and we know there are, for whom that doesn't work, for whom, for whatever reason, God is not intervening to change their sexual orientation or gender identity, then those people have to live life somehow. So for those of us who are LGBTQ, what do we do? And for the rest of the church, how do we love people?
in the midst of their journey. Now, back in the 90s, a group called Bridges Across the Divide came up with uh, a model for talking about, in their case, homosexuality and the disagreements about homosexuality. And they came up with these terms side A and side B. Side A folks believed that same-sex marriage is equally valid to uh, opposite-sex marriage. Side B, that's the affirming view. Side B was marriage between a man and a woman, and um, that's God's intent for our sexuality. For many years, folks who talk about LGBTQ issues in the church have used that model, that side A, side B model, for talking about disagreement in the church. And it's helpful sometimes when you're talking about theology of marriage. But it doesn't address trans folks at all, and I actually think that the modern church is split a little bit more like this. Three ways. So this is my suggestion for a way of talking about where we are in the church today. One of these views I would describe as the pushback approach. This is like three different Christian views to LGBTQ folks. One of them I would call pushback. The pushback approach basically assumes that being LGBTQ is something in your control, something you could change or choose. If you're gay or bi or trans, it's your fault. It represents a moral failing. The pushback group treats LGBTQ folks as political or cultural opponents in a war for the future. You chose this, it's sinful, we don't want anyone else to choose this, so we're gonna push back as hard as possible against any kind of affirmation or acceptance so that fewer people will choose this in the future. That's essentially the pushback approach. A second approach would be what I call the cross to bear approach. Now this approach shares the same underlying biblical view of marriage and gender, for the most part, as the first one. This approach would not affirm same-sex marriage, would not affirm, say, like gender confirmation generally. Like, this, this view still holds to traditional biblical understandings uh, of these questions, as they would describe it. However, they would say, no, we don't think your sexual orientation or gender identity is your fault. This may be something that for whatever reason has been given to you as a lifelong struggle, a cross to bear, your thorn in the flesh. And so we want to welcome you and we want to support you in that journey, but we know that some of our theological views may be difficult for you as an LGBTQ person, but we want you to be welcome here and we want to walk this journey with you. That would be the cross to bear approach. Yeah. <laughs> And then the third view is, as you might guess, the fully affirming approach. Fully affirming of same-sex marriage, um, of expressing gender identity as part of how God made you, not as a burden to bear. Um, the idea that you should be able to, as an LGBTQ person, flourish in life and relationships under the same rules as non-LGBTQ people, but adapt it for your orientation or gender identity. And so I put these in sort of in the order of like how much the average LGBTQ, LGBTQ person likes them. <laughs> but I, I meet a lot of Christians who are in that middle space, who say to me, Justin, I want to be as loving as I can be as a Christian. Genuinely, I want to be loving. Uh, my institution, my church or college or or Bible study group, whatever, wants to be as loving as we possibly can be. But we can't get to that affirmation place theologically. I just can't reconcile it with scripture. We don't want to push back on people and treat them as if they're issues. Is there room in this middle space where we can actually be loving to people? Is that possible? And my answer to that is going to be revealed momentarily. Um, <laughs> no. No, my answer is yes. Yes, I do believe you can hold a conservative view of marriage and still love and support LGBTQ folks. Asterisk. Fine print is on the way. To see why it's complicated, let's quickly just take a look under the hood of each of these approaches. That's also the butchest thing you're going to hear me say tonight. <laughs> yeah! We're going to take a look under the hood and also sports metaphor.
That would have been funnier if like I actually could think of a sports metaphor, but I don't know. <laughs> something, something, innings, something, I don't know. Okay, so I think the pushback approach is responsible for a lot of the bad reputation that Christians have today when it comes to LGBTQ folks. Um, Julia Louis-Dreyfus, before she was on Veep, was on a show back in the 90s called Seinfeld. Yeah. <laughs> That was super gay, sorry. <laughs> Why am I apologizing? That was super gay! Yeah! <laughs> um, no, so she was on a, on a show called Seinfeld. Uh, who played, she played a character named Elaine. And there was an episode where she found out her boyfriend, David Putty, was a Christian. Now, as is typical of Hollywood, Christians don't come out looking great in this episode. Her boyfriend is also kind of an idiot in the other episodes. <laughs> And David Putty's played by Patrick, Patrick Warburton, by the way. So um, Elaine asks, Patrick, asks uh, David at one point, um, do you believe in God? And he's like, yeah, that's right. And she's like, huh, so you're pretty religious. And he's like, yeah. And she goes, so does it bother you that I'm not religious? And he goes, no, it doesn't bother me. She's like, really? Why not? Because I'm not the one going to hell. <laughs> and she's like, David, I'm going to hell, the worst place in the world with the, the devils and the caves and the, and the ragged clothing and the heat. What do you think about all that? And he's like, oh, it's going to be rough. <laughs> and she hits him and she's like, you should be trying to save me. And he goes, don't boss me. This is why you're going to hell. And she's like, I am not going to hell. And if you think I'm going to hell, you should care that I'm going to hell, even though I am not. Yeah. <laughs> and I kind of feel like that sometimes. Like, if you think that something that I'm doing is, is wrong, that God is punishing me, that I have to be celibate or any of it, you should care. Because otherwise it's just opposition without compassion. And that's kind of what pushback is. It's dehumanizing. It's opposition without compassion. I oppose you, but I don't really care about how you're doing. And I, and I think there are a couple of reasons for that. I think sometimes it's because people believe it's a choice. And so it's just, it's like the doctor, it's like the joke about the doctor. A uh, person says, doc, it hurts when I do this. And the doctor says, then stop doing that. Um, there's this sense of like, gosh, I'm, you know, I, it's really hard to be an LGBTQ person on this campus, in this church, in, you know, as a Christian, and they're like, then just stop being an LGBTQ person. I mean, you're choosing it. But if you talk to LGBTQ people, it immediately becomes obvious that it's not a choice. Many of us have suffered a lot. Even if it were a choice, um, we should still care about people, even if they make bad choices. Right? We should still care about them, but often we don't unless we think that something is beyond their control. I think one of the solutions to address folks who are in this space is to let them hear stories. If you know people who think that being gay or bi or trans is a choice, I encourage you to expose them in whatever way you can to the stories of LGBTQ Christians and some of the challenges that we've been through and let them really hear our stories. Something else has started to happen that those 1970s ex-gay folks never expected, which is the ex-gay world itself has become a, a, a way to prop up the it's a choice argument by saying it can be changed, and so even if you didn't choose it originally, it's still a choice because you're choosing not to change it. But it's not until people realize that it's not something that you choose or could change that they begin to actually think about the burden that many LGBTQ people carry, especially as Christians. And that's what takes us to that cross to bear approach. This is a more caring approach, saying you're not an enemy, you're a person. And I realize that some of what I believe the Bible says might be difficult for you, it might feel like a heavy burden, but I care and I want you to feel welcome and loved. And there are even LGBTQ Christians who are in that space. There's a community of folks called Spiritual Friendship. There's another group called Revoice. Um, authors like my friend Eve Tushnet, my friend Wesley Hill. These are gay Christians who've written about being gay and Christian and celibate because they believe that's what the Bible requires. They are also not in that full affirmation place, even though I think the majority of LGBTQ folks would like for you to be there. 
well, there's some folks who are in that, in that cross to bear place. And that's important to recognize. And yet, I know a lot of Christian institutions that want to be in that space. If you ask them where they were, that's where they would identify themselves as being. And they would say, oh, and we love people like Wesley Hill and Eve Tushnet and Revoice and Spiritual Friendship and all these LGBTQ folks, well, and mostly gay folks, who are in this space. And yet, a lot of LGBTQ folks who know those people or are in those institutions would say, uh, we don't feel safe and welcome, despite the fact that these folks want us to feel safe and welcome. And then they come to me and they say, why is it these folks don't feel safe and welcome? We want them to feel safe and welcome. We're trying to do something we, we, we know other LGBTQ people, other G LGBTQ Christians say that we can do. We're trying to do it, but they're not happy with it. It seems like all they want is full affirmation. Why won't they take our love? Take our love! <laughs> There are a couple of different reasons that this happens. One of them is some of them think that they are here when in fact I think that they are here. They're in that ex gay space. I saw this uh, prank show thing a while back where they tricked diners in a nice restaurant by filling water bottles with water from a hose, from the tap through a garden hose, and then putting fancy labels on the bottles and telling them that it was fancy water, and then they paid money to like drink this fancy water. And they were like, oh, this is delicious. Um, one of the things that's happened as more and more folks have turned against the ex-gay movement, and they don't use the term ex-gay anymore, that's just the term I'm using because it's what they used to call themselves, and I'm just trying to be consistent here. Um, is that they're still selling folks the same contaminated water, but they've slapped a new label on it. And I, I'm a, I'm not an activisty kind of guy. Like I'm, I'm pretty laid back. Like I'm not. I get super uncomfortable when I like have to call anybody out. I'm not a call people out kind of person. Like I am all about let's love each other and be friends even when we disagree and whatever. So like I just want you to know I feel super uncomfortable like saying these ex gay groups bad. But I've seen so many people's lives destroyed by these groups. I've heard so many stories and I've listened to so many people bawl for hours on end. I've known so many people who've walked away from their faith or worse um, because of these groups that this is an exception that I will make where I'm just going to be really blunt with you all. This is contaminated water that they're selling. Um, as research began to show the psychological damage of what these groups had been doing, and they remember, they started out as groups of gay people, gay Christians, who were trying to do what God wanted. So like, these are not villains. These are people who are trying to do the right thing. But it became institutionalized, and when it didn't work, the leaders who discovered it didn't work fell away, and the new leaders came in who believed it worked, and it's been perpetuated for several decades, and it's hurt a lot of people. As people started to turn against this, what they started to do was um, change the language that they use publicly. And one of the ways that they've done that is if you go to the websites of most ex-gay groups today, they will have something on their website somewhere that tells you, we do not do conversion therapy. And they do this because conversion therapy is the word, is the term that a lot of folks in the secular sphere are using right now as they're trying to attack this kind of stuff in secular spaces. And they will say, we do not do conversion therapy. And a lot of people read that and think, oh good, this is not an ex-gay group. But if you actually read more or ask questions and dig a little deeper, you find that the reasons they say they do not do conversion therapy are things like this. And these are all real reasons that current ex-gay groups are currently giving for why they do not do conversion therapy. You can tell that we don't do conversion therapy. I, this is my paraphrase of what they're saying. This is not, I want to be clear, these are not quotes, but these are, these are actual things that they're saying. Uh, you can tell we don't do conversion therapy because we do not use the term conversion therapy. That is a propaganda term that other people use. We don't use it. This is not conversion therapy. Or we do not do reparative therapy. And this is literally on a website of a major national ex-gay organization. We do not do reparative therapy. 
Reparative therapy is a trademarked term of Dr. Nicolosi, who is dead. We do not consider what we do therapy. We consider it ministry. So these groups have set themselves up as like not ex-gay. And a lot of deeply compassionate, well-meaning Christians who are in that middle space are turning to some of these groups who have set themselves up as authorities on LGBTQ folks, and they've borrowed their language and their materials, and they're using them without knowing that these are ex-gay materials. Or they're referring people to these ministries without knowing that they're referring people to ex-gay ministries. And then people, and then LGBTQ folks are like, something about this, it doesn't feel right. And they're like, well, I don't know, we're here. And it's like, no, actually, you're here. But sometimes people really are in the cross to bear space, and it's something still not, not working out. And the, the reason for this is there are two different versions of that cross to bear space. One of them is what I would call the sympathy framework. This is your burden to bear, and I have so much sympathy for you. This is way more sympathetic than the pushback approach. It's more compassionate. It sees us as human beings, as genuine sympathy for our burden. But it's kind of like... There's an episode of 30 Rock, which is another great show, where Liz Lemon, played by Tina Fey, is sick, and she's in the bathroom, and she's like hugging the toilet, and Jack Donaghy, her boss, played by Alec Baldwin, is standing in the bathroom, and she's like, do you even care how miserable I am right now? And Jack is kind of like, doesn't know what to do, so he looks around, and he takes a broom, and he goes, there, there. <laughs> You can tell he really genuinely has sympathy for her. He really cares. What I think is most interesting about this, about this moment is as he's like stroking her with the broom from a distance, she says, oh, that feels good. She's so starved for something that that is a positive step. And I know LGBTQ folks who are like, oh my gosh, just the littlest bit of sympathy, that would be amazing. But you know what? Sympathy is not really where we want to be ultimately as a church. Because there's something missing here that distinguishes this from the kind of spaces that people like Wes Hill and Eve Tushnet are working to create, the revoice and all of that. It's empathy. Rather than if this is your burden to bear, this is our burden to share. If I believe that you are called to lifelong celibacy, to be sympathetic is to say, gosh, that sounds hard. <laughs> to be empathetic is to say, let me think about this for a minute. Let me put myself in your shoes and imagine how difficult it would be if somebody told me I had to be celibate for the rest of my life. And realizing this is not about sex. This is about not having that companionship, that love, that romance, that family, not having kids. That means when you get old, who's gonna take care of you? If you get sick, who's gonna be there for you? What happens when all your friends are married off and they don't have time and you're alone and you don't wanna be alone? That is a hard thing. And so if I think that's what God's called you to, and I really have empathy, I should care enough to figure out how I can help you share that burden. And that might sound crazy to say that the church should share the burden of somebody like being celibate or feeling a burden because of who they are. But you know, in the Bible, Christians are commanded to do exactly that, to care for the widows, the orphans, the vulnerable, the hurting, the alone. Their burden becomes the church's communal burden. But this is about empathy. Rather than 30 Rock, you know, there, there. This is like Lord of the Rings. This is like, and my axe, you know? This is like, yeah. Now, let me be honest with you. Over the years, as I studied what the Bible had to say and talked to lots of LGBTQ Christians and prayed about what I had learned and trusted the Holy Spirit to guide me and continued to study the scriptures deeply and passionately over a long period of time, I came to this spot, full affirmation. That burden wasn't from God to begin with. That's what I believe. That is, that is that I don't think that gay folks are called to celibacy or that bi folks are called to avoid 
uh, romance with the person that they fall in love with just because that person is of the same sex. I believe that, that folks who are trans should be able to live outwardly the gender identity that they have inside. That's where I am. I know that's not where Baylor is. I know that's not where a lot of my Christian friends are and a lot of Christian institutions. And as I said, I didn't come here to say, now I'm gonna tell you why you all should agree with me. What I came here to say was, if you don't agree with me, let's talk about being empathetic and the actual um, impact that this has on LGBTQ people and how you can help share that burden with them and how you can love them and not just pawn them off on ex-gay ministries and expect that to do the job or just think that they're there is gonna be all right. Mm -hmm. Now that said, I would love for you to learn about what I think. Uh, you know, I, it's in my book, Torn. I wrote about it a little bit and on my website, you can go to my YouTube channel and you can watch videos if you really wanna know how I got to full affirmation, which is what everybody wants to know and they want me to talk about it and I will, but not here. <coughs> not this time. Baylor can invite me back to do that talk. If they want. Um, and I know, and I know, some of you who agree with me on this are like, yeah. I mean, we actually really love you to like preach a sermon for this. And some of you who don't agree are like, well, why would I even want to know an argument for that? Because I already believe that that's unbiblical. To those of you who disagree with me, I want to share with you this quote from John Stuart Mill: "He who knows only his own side of the case knows little of that. His reasons may be good." And no one may have been able to refute them, but if he is equally unable to refute the reasons on the opposite side, if he does not so much as know what they are, he has no ground for preferring either opinion. Nor is it enough that he should hear the arguments of adversaries from his own teachers presented as they state them and accompanied by what they offer as refutations. He must be able to hear them from persons who actually believe them. He must know them in their most plausible and persuasive form. Ultimately, I think as students, even if you know that you strongly disagree with, uh, with my theological position on some of these things, I, I hope that at some point you will educate yourself and hear from, if not from me, from somebody else who uh, shares my view and who can speak convincingly about it, if only so that you can understand why you disagree and make sure that you have your biblical analysis and stuff shored up and so that you're not just using straw man and assuming that all like gay Christians are just throwing out the Bible because we're not. But I want you also to notice this. That white line there, as I mentioned before, that is the, the line where the theological disagreement comes in, is between that full affirmation space and everything else. All of the rest of these are positions you can hold and still have a very conservative reading of scripture when it comes to LGBTQ folks. And so if you say to me, I can't get to the full affirmation place, or maybe you are there, but other people in your life or other people on this campus can't get there, what I say to all the folks, all my Christian friends who can't get to the full affirmation place is look, I'm not asking you to believe something that you don't believe the Bible says, but I am asking can you get as far up on that empathy scale as you possibly can? Get close to that white line and show as much empathy as possible. Because even if you can't cross the line, there's a lot you can do still. And as Christians who serve an empathetic God, one who literally experienced life as one of us and suffered with us and for us, we should be a shining example to the world of what empathy looks like. Anything less than that is unworthy of the name of Christ. And now, the asterisk. <laughs> if you're not trans, you might not have noticed that when I was talking about the middle space, the burden space, the empathy sympathy space, I did not talk about gender identity, at least not much. That was intentional. Because here's the bad news that I really don't know how to sugarcoat and I don't know what to do about it and if some of you have a great idea, I would love to hear it. I don't think that there's an equivalent for uh, be fully affirmed as a gay person but celibate, be fully affirmed as a bi person but only heterosexual relationships are available to you, which by the way then bi people end up feeling erased and feeling like part of their identity is not seen, that people assume that they're straight and all of that. And that's a whole conversation that I wish we had time to get into. Um, I don't think there's an equivalent to that for trans folks. Because if you say to a, to a trans person, you cannot be on the outside who you are on the inside, the only way to do it is somehow change who you are on the inside, but that hasn't worked. Um, or then just go through your life like faking it. Um, I don't think that that's 
the same as asking somebody to be celibate. I think asking somebody to be celibate for life is like a lot. It's really scary. It's scary to me if that's, you know, something that, the, that God ever required of me. I don't think that's what God's requiring. I hope. Please, God. Um, <laughs> but that does not compare to not being able to be honest about who you are for your whole life. And um, I don't know, y'all. Those of you who are in the conservative space when it comes to gender identity, I do not know how you can be loving. I mean, there are ways you can be loving, to be compassionate and kind, but I do not know how you create spaces that allow trans folks to flourish within that framework. I don't. Um, and that's a challenge. It's still early in the trans conversation for the church. We've been talking about gender identity much less than we've been talking about sexual orientation, and we're still struggling with sexual orientation. But I'll tell you my feeling about gender identity, and I say this as a gay guy who is not trans, and so I just want to be clear that um, you need a trans person on this stage to share their experience. Um, I... Contrary to popular belief, I am not the gay Lorax who speaks for the T's. <laughs> when it comes to gender identity and theology and how we continue to be loving in a space of disagreement and what this looks like, um, there are a lot of challenges. Any of you who've wrestled with questions of gender identity in your own lives or um, on campus in your friends or family members lives you know that these are complicated subjects um, and as somebody who's not trans there's still there's still a lot of things I'm still learning from my trans friends I've been talking about this with my trans friends for the last 20 years and I still find myself learning new things all the time which is why ultimately you need to hear directly from trans folks um, there are questions you could ask me theologically about gender and gender identity that I do not have an answer to but I do know for a fact that I'm called to love. I know that when one of my best friends said to me, you know, all my life people saw me as a girl, and all my life that's felt wrong in the innermost core of my being. I've been through years and years of depression because something felt mismatched between my brain and my body, and I've been through every therapy under the sun until finally I was just able to admit what I've known since I was little that I identify as male and not female. And since admitting that, it's been the first time in my life that I felt comfortable in my own skin and been able to relax and focus on living life instead of wasting every bit of energy focusing on this body that always felt wrong. I know that when my friend said that to me, he was not asking for my theological opinion on gender. He was not asking for my permission or my judgment on every decision that had led him to that point. He was telling me something deeply personal about himself that he had held inside for years and years and years, and he was asking me to see him, to love him the way God loves him, right exactly as he is right now. And I show him that I see him and that I love him by using the words he and him. When I do that, it's not a chess move. I am not taking a position in some big theological debate about gender and design and diversity and creation and the fall and the future of gender identity in the church and society. I am simply loving my friend and saying, I see you. And of course, that is significantly easier to do in situations where you agree with the person's decisions than when you disagree. But showing this basic kind of courtesy to someone when they say, use this language for me, is not reserved for situations where you agree. Because even if you disagree, this isn't like having a child who's addicted to drugs and needs someone to show them tough love and hold an intervention since no one else will tell them the truth. The LGBTQ person who comes out in a place like Baylor has, I guarantee you, been hearing negative messages about LGBTQ people from one source or another, and maybe many, their whole life. They've wrestled with loneliness and fear and questions, and it has taken courage and persistence for them to get where they are today, wherever that is. So in a world that constantly tells us that LGBTQ folks, constantly tells us LGBTQ folks that we can't be Christians and tries in every possible way to pull us away from Christ, what we need more than anything is that person who will just listen and love us and trust the spirit to work in our lives and not think that they know more about what we've been through than we do. To be like Jesus, 
who was criticized for being a friend of sinners, who scandalized the Pharisees and the teachers of the law by who he hung out with. Not his projects, not his charity cases, not waiting for the moment to drop truth bombs, but as friends. Tim Keller said, to be loved but not known is comforting but superficial. To be known and not loved is our greatest fear. But to be fully known and truly loved is, well, a lot like being loved by God. It is what we need more than anything. At the end of the day, whatever you think of my theological views on this or that topic, I want Baylor and the church to be places where everyone knows that they can be known and loved. Listen to people, hear their stories, share their stories, show grace to one another, recognize that these are complicated questions. Make sure that students here on campus, make sure that people in your life, in your friendship circles, at your church have places to serve and to do and to be and to live out their faith and not just to have all the no's. My friend Eve Tushnet talks about the vocation of no. You cannot have a vocation of not gay marrying and not having gay sex. Give people a vocation. Give people a way to live and to be. And if people think you're being too affirming and they get the wrong idea, you know what? That's what Jesus was criticized for, that glutton and drunkard and friend of sinners. And I'm going to end with this. To the LGBTQ folks who are here, because very often you do not get to be the primary audience of any conversation in the church. Even when we're talking about LGBTQ issues, we don't always talk to LGBTQ people. So I want to end with this to LGBTQ people. You have something important to add to the body of Christ. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. You are needed. Your experiences give you empathy. You've learned humility. You understand why some of our biggest critics, why some of the church's biggest critics are our biggest critics, because you've experienced that pain directly. Your faith has gotten stronger in many cases from fighting for it. And if it hasn't gotten stronger, then you know why so many people struggle with their faith. You have credibility as an LGBTQ person that the church at large does not have in our culture today. So use your gifts and don't let anybody convince you that you are not needed in the church. Represent the church to the world, demonstrate grace, and above all, don't wait for somebody to welcome you into the body of Christ. You don't have to be welcomed into the body of Christ. You already are the body of Christ. That's right. If the church is going to regain its saltiness in our culture, it's going to depend in large part on you. God loves you. God wants to use you. So go be the church. Thank you.